Hello class. So this presentation is about Homi Baba and Dipesh Chakrabarti, the two final post-colonial theorists that we will be discussing in this class. So the rest of the course will be about the method, about the writing and the presenting of your case studies and also some case studies for, and uh, topics from me uh, on uh, several post-colonial topics such as uh, decolonization, feminism, development, indigenous knowledge, among others. So the first of uh, the two thinkers that we will be discussing today is Homi K. Baba. Homi K. Baba is born in 1949 in Mumbai, India, and is, until recently, the Anne F. Rothenberg Professor of the Humanities at Harvard University. So two of his important, some of his important works are Location of Culture, published in 1994, and Framing Fanon, in, uh, published in 2005. So the lecture today will be about location of culture and some of the reviews that are done about this book and uh, the book itself. So the key concepts that we will be discussing today are the following. The third space, hybridity, mimicry, and amb ambivalence. Now, so the major concept will be hybridity, which is explaining all the other concepts or is related to the other concepts. So admittedly, this is one. These are some of the hardest to understand and also to explain post-colonial concepts. But they tell us about the continuity of the story that we're trying to uh, trying to tell in Social Science 198. Because it looks at, again, it looks at colonialism, its lingering effects. And if in Fanon we were, um, we were able to discuss the psychoanalytic part of it, the psychological effect of colonialism to to people in terms of people having um, a case of you know an identity crisis because of being in between, that will be continued in Homi Baba, okay, through the concept of the third space. Okay, but uh, in contrast to Fanon, uh, this uh, this discussion by Homi Baba is more optimistic in the sense that it is, as I've said in the lecture note, uh, Franz Fanon is kind of def uh, kind of very pessimistic about the view about the effect of uh, colonialism to the psyche of a person, but uh, Fanon at the same time is also an icon as uh, uh, an icon for anti uh, anti colonial struggles and nationalist struggles during the 60s and even uh, during his time so in contrast to that the homi baba opens up through this concepts the space wherein the post colonial could stage their resistance consciously and unconsciously. So these concepts describe ways in which colonized peoples have resisted the power of the colonizer, a power that is never as secure as it seems to be. So throughout the discussion, I will be um, mentioning some of the other thinkers that we have talked about, okay, and uh, introducing new concepts as per Homi Baba. So uh, these are the theoretical and philosophical foundations of Baba's work. Uh, first is Lacanian psychoanalysis and Derridean uh, deconstruction. So hence, why is it uh, why it is a very hard topic to to discuss? But I won't be discussing these two. If you're interested, there are many books in our library and also uh, in the scientific journals that we have access to regarding Lacan and regarding Derrida. So for philosophy minors, I think that you have also met uh, these people. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I won't be going into much of the theoretical and philosophical foundations, but I just want to mention that this is where he got uh, influence from. So first, he defines the location of culture and the third space. So we will understand this better in a bit, but here is the definition. So liminal space 
or the third space is a liminal space in between the designations of identity that becomes the process of symbolic interaction, the connective tissue that constructs the difference between upper and lower, black and white. So there is not much contextualization here because in the last lecture notes, we have discussed the differences in a way of uh, in terms of the binaries, the black and white. And in the previous lecture notes and the previous lecture uh, videos, we have also discussed this in detail, the difference or the binary that colonialism have has, uh, has made, has created in post-colonial cultures. That in post-colonial cultures, we always have um, we are always in the opposite side of the colonizer, that they are white, we're black or brown, uh, they're north, we're south, and uh, they're developed and we are underdeveloped. So what is important in Baba's work is his idea that there is a third space. This liminal space, when you say liminal, it's kind of like in the border, in the border of uh, one of the categories that you can just cross the border. So that's the liminal space. And uh, it, to, to understand it better, it's like the in-between, wherein you're not in one space nor the other. You're neither black nor white. As you have, uh, as you remember, if you remember, we also discussed this in the le lecture notes for Fanon in the Wretched of the Earth and the Black Skin and White Masks, wherein... The in-between between being black and white is it's a very ambivalent, it's a very ambiguous position to be in, especially if, for example, like him, you are living abroad and you are coming into terms with your own identity as a person, but you're also coming into terms uh, with your identity as a black person with the stereotypes, etc. So Baba is always also discussing that and calls it the third space, the liminal space wherein we try to define our identity. So as Filipinos, we could understand this space very well because we are, um, until the present, we cannot be called a developed country. Okay, It is also true that we are colonized by many colonizers and are still feeling the effects of this colon col these colonialisms in terms of our religion, our education system, our political system, and even our values as a people. So what entails being in the third space? So that's the third space that Baba is talking about. So as I've mentioned, the third space is the site or location where the subaltern or the colonized negotiate their identity. So I have discussed the subaltern in detail in, in my lecture notes about Spivak. Okay, so the subaltern are a group of people who do not have access to power. So it's different from just being uh, the colonized. So it's another category altogether. So uh, in this third space, you can see the subaltern and the colonized. So in this space, there is a kind of production of a mutual, uh, it's a mutual recognition, a representation of cultural difference. Because when you are in between, you, are, you can see the difference of the two categories that you are in, in between of, right? So you can see the difference of your culture to the other culture and the difference of the other culture to your culture. So this in between is a very, it's very interesting to be in this position. But um, we will see later that this is a space where we negotiate our identity. What, ito nababanggit ko na siya in, in lecture videos and lecture notes before, but what does it mean to negotiate our identity? And why is the idea of a third space very important? First, because the idea of the third space denotes it's it's a kind of um, continuation and also nuancing of Said's work, which which uh, tells us about the binaries, diba? that there are just two categories. In the third space, you have a third in-between category and also, this tells us about another phase of colonialism, which could be very important to, which could be more important. Like, for example, if you cannot relate with uh, Fanon in the work of, in his work, 
because it's about Algerians, it's about his people. If you cannot relate to that, and because it's a thing of the past, it's history, maybe we could relate more on with the third space, because it is a space that we also could um, occupy in the present, because it talks about colonialism as a practice or a, as a process of cultural interactions. That colonialism is not just the um, going, for example, the dominating domination of one country to another. It's actually an interaction of cultures. And what happens when cultures interact? Yun yung tinitingnan dito sa um, third space. That we look at uh, colonialism as a period of complex and varied cultural contact and interaction. And in the third space, the third space is not just it's also important to note that the third space is not just where the subaltern is. We will see later that even the colonizer could be in the third space. So what is the implication or what are the implications of a third space? One implication and one major point of Baba is that there is no pure culture. Meaning, even though they claim that colonizers claim that colonizers and the West, even as of today, they claim that they have a pure culture. Like, for example, Americans would say that their democracy is a pure one or their democracy is a... Indeed, it's a consolidated one, meaning it's at the latter stages of democracy. But um, there is no pure culture. So an implication of this is that the colonizer or the West cannot claim that they have the sole claim to knowledge, to culture, and to superiority. Okay? So as a response to Said, uh, Baba's work also takes on binary, saying that it is not absolute because of the third space. And the third space, rather than being a destructive place, wherein, for example, uh, in Fanon, it becomes a place wherein the colonized is very anxious to... To be like the whites, it creates an anxiety to be like the whites. Um, even though there is a problem like that, there is a possibility of agency or resistance on part of on the part of the colonized. When you are in the third space, when you are trying to negotiate your identity, when you look at yourself in the context of your society, of your history, that you can do something because you are not bound by either category. Okay. You, are, you are not bound by being, for example, um, you are against the idea of linear history that not because you are post-colonial does it mean that your country should also follow the development path of the West, that you could also be uh, developed in your own terms, that we could actually define the things that are important to us in our own terms. So that is one major point of Baba, that this third space is productive rather rather than destructive. And that's one thing that I want you to, that's one takeaway that I want you to have from this presentation. Okay, so speaking of resistance and responses, mimicry and hybridity are related uh, concepts. Okay, related concepts to the third space. So mimicry is one such way wherein we could exist in the third space or one of the processes that is happening in the third space. So mimicry, according to Baba, is the desire for a reformed, recognizable, recognizable other as a subject of difference that is almost the same but not quite. So mimicry, as uh, as you know, uh, the, the most basic definition of the term is to repeat, right? To to copy. Okay? So there is mimicry on the part of the colonizer and there is also mimicry on the part of the colonized. So on part of the colonizer, the colonizer wants the colonized to mimic them. Okay? Saan natin to makikita? Um, for example, when the Spaniards came here in the Philippines, they want to make us little brown Spaniards. Okay? It's the same with the Americans when they came here in the Philippines. Okay? They want us to be educated. 
No, they want to change the political system, the social and the educational system of the Philippines because apparently it's very uh, backward and they want the Filipinos to catch up kumbaga, in the development. But inherent in all of those discussions, discourses, is the idea that they want the colonized to be an image of themselves. Which makes sense no? because that is, we discussed this in the post-colonialism lecture video wherein, uh, and the imperialism lecture video, wherein we said that colon the colonized or the, the colonized is, you know, is part of the mission of the colonizer. That their justification of coloni colonization and imperialism is to civilize, right? So mimicry is part of that process. They want us to mimic them. So, indeed, it's an overt goal of imperial pol policy. Overt because you can really see it in documents and in historical uh, historical um, sources. Okay? And, um, again, again, if you cannot relate to, for example, colonialism in the historical sense, it still happens up to today wherein, wh where or when developing countries are are still are still in uh, are still following okay, the the path laid to them by by the west through development projects okay that the goal still is to be like other countries yeah, so the result is a blurred copy or a parody so um the funny thing about it, this is that Baba is noting how the process of mimicry is very serious. Like for example, you know, we want they want us to be colon they want colonized people to be like them. But the result is not the result that they are they that they want. Because the result of for example, in the Spanish colonial period in the Philippines, the result of a botched and uh, a very incomplete, very religious educational system should be very pious and very uh, very submissive peoples, right? But through time, you can, you will see that we did not really we did not really um, adopt Catholicism in full. So there is this idea of syncretism, right? Where we, in the beginning and until the present, we are incorporating some of our values to to Catholicism so that it would make more sense to us. So for example, our adoration or our uh, yes, our adoration of the the Holy Family, okay, or of Mama Mary. Okay. Um, these are not in the original, for example, original versions of Catholicism, but it is how we adopted. And even though it is not what the church intended, in the beginning, okay, or it was just something they used to 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 make or to make it easy for for them to assimilate Filipinos and to convert them to Catholicism. In the end, it became something that we used. It became something that we used to revolt against them. Okay. Um, in this regard, you can read the Passion and the Revolu Revolution by Reynaldo Eleto when he said that the narratives of the Passion, the coming of the the Lord, you know, the redemption after it became the dream of Filipinos after or during and after the revolution. So as you can see, it's a blurred copy and sometimes it's a parody of what is the original. So that's what makes... Uh, Baba, I, I think different because he looks at the different, a different part of colonialism, which is not the more, it's not more on the political power, like for example, the, or the discursive power, but also how the people have resisted through very ingenious means, like for example, mimicry. Mimicry is, according to Baba, also a compromise between the synchronic and the diachronic or the something that is the status quo and the possibility of change. 
Okay? So, it's also a compromise between identity, meaning a pure, for example, pure Filipino identity versus uh, cultural differences, our cultural uh, differences with our oppressors or our colonizers. Because again, this is in the third space. This is in the space wherein we we renegotiate our identities. Meaning, um, in mimicry, we are not just the victims. Okay, we are not just the victims, but we are actually producing something out of this situation. Okay, it's also the result of the tension between the desire for control and the natural progress of history, or how cultures cultures work or progress. So as I've said. Baba is thinking about the other side of colonialism, which is the more cultural part of it, wherein it's really a cultural interaction between two cultures that are very different that in the long run would need to would need to um, think about ways of how it could coexist. So that's what happened, for example, in the last century of the Spanish colonization in the Philippines, wherein... Um, it would be natural that people will be fed up with very oppressive systems, okay? Because uh, it's artificial, eh? the the colonization process. It's artificial. You're coming in in another country and imposing them your culture, your values, but they have values of their own. And uh, naturally, um, of course, there, you will have theories on this. For example, in anthropology and psychology. So, but it's natural, right? That it's natural that the, these people will interact, they will learn each other's words or culture, their language. And there will come a point where in yun nga, there will be tension because the dominant culture, for example, the Spaniards or the Americans, would want control of um of the Filipinos in terms of their culture, their lang uh, their culture, not language because they do not want to, to teach us Span Spanish. But um, the people will will then dream or work for change. They do not want to be uh, beholden, especially when you have groups that will fight for for change in a in a, in in a colonial setting. Okay, so again, if you cannot relate to the you know to the history lesson, you can apply this to to the present, wherein. Um, you will have a discrepancy or a discrepancy between the values of the people, we as a Filipino people, and the values of our leaders, for example. Okay, we're not it, we're, we're not saying that we're uh, coming from different cultures, but they are coming from a different view, which is yun nga, the political view that yun, they they need to have power, they need to have um, they need to maintain their wealth their family's name, which is different from maybe what we view political or, uh, yeah, political office is all about. So, in the long run, there will, be, there will be tensions of these identities, these differences, right? So, ayun, uh, they would desire to control us through, for example, martial law, through uh, this information, but if you are in the in-between and you are looking at these processes, the process of uh, or these identities, then you will be able to see that there will be there needs to be change. So this is how mimicry is productive according to, to Baba. It makes you, you know, you're not the victim. You're not the victim in you're not just the victim in a, in the in the situation of colonization or oppression. No, that there could be some there could be something that you can do for for your country and for yourself because it is also about your identity so where can we see mimicry so baba has a discussion on mimicry as a humor okay through satires and parody and even memes so as i i i am thinking of memes about us as an an imperial power where in where there is oil there is democracy <laughs> Uh, and uh, other other satires and parody about um, about uh, colonialism, about Western domination of uh, Western culture that is now dominating 
the world and also in language like for example baba is also discussing about the the fact that some for example some indians because he is an indian scholar some indians would have an accent have a british accent so some are consciously consciously wanting to be british okay that's a fact too um some are unconsciously doing it because it's it's what is taught to them by their educational system so there is mimicry in in that but again the important thing is that how is it used to be to to be an avenue for resistance or how can it be seen as something that is an integral or an important part of colonialism so i found some examples of how it is it used like for example um i cannot I cannot quote some of the I cannot quote a Rizal in his Noli and Fili, but you will see in his book. I cannot quote because of uh, time constraints, and there will be many. But in his book, uh, as you know, it's really uh, a satire of uh, Spanish uh, colonialism in terms of the the inept character of the friars, right? um and the uh, and you will see there the humor also that he puts into it the sass kumbaga that he puts into it when he criticizes the the church and uh, how the people know the how people know in general the ano uh, the the intentions of the church so for example there's this one scene we're in people were intently listening to to padre damaso and um they're they're joking they're joking because damaso padre damaso is speaking in spanish and castilian and is not understood by uh filipinos by who he calls indios during that time and they're just fishing no because they the fishing for words that they understand in in the sermon so they joke uh, with themselves and there are also actual parodies by um some filipino authors yung authors like for example um forgot who did it but someone uh, did a parody of um the the prayers and uh, made it into made it into uh in a parody of the prayers that is against the the, the friars okay so ayun. and then um yeah in results not in feel you can see this humor this you, you can see this idea of um people mimicking not just miming ah, that's just not just copying but people being aware that they are very different and this difference makes it very funny for them no because what it does is that what is what it does is is that it reduces or it takes away some power from the colonizer like for example for example from padre damaso because he's being laughed at by by the people that you know it's not completely a relationship where you know the, the people are being dominated by by the colonizer Okay, so that's one such resistance. No, hindi siya yung hindi man siya yung resistance na nakikibaka ganyan, but it's resistance in itself. So that's what's important and what what is Baba saying too. And this one, it's not in the colonial setting, but yung paggamit ng ano mga simbolo, mga salita na kayo lang yung nakakaintindi. Kahit na for example, ito ay Filipino. Like for example, these protest placards from uh 1980s ayan where people are joking or using humor no para ano uh, to 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 voice out their their uh their protests against the the government like for example during that time the dictator of Uganda is Idi Amin it, it's not really related to to the Philippines or whatever but it's a symbol that you know uh they are using they are using a language that only they could understand and that prohibits or that 
it, it prohibits the dominating class, for example, the Marcoses or the administration then, to uh, understand easily what they what they mean. Okay, and also it's it's fun. It's fun for them. No, of course, protest is not fun, but it's a more humorous way of protesting of fighting. Ayan. So, ayan, even this Nino, hindi ka nag-iisa and Makoy, nag-iisa ka. No, it's also uh, a way of um, being in that third space. Not exactly mimicry, but being in that third space. So, this will be more clear, I, I hope, in the next few slides. So, uh, I am thinking also in uh, the present where there are so many fun placards through when there are protests. And again, these are ways wherein we renegotiate our identities. Even though we are different from the ones we are protesting from, they, are, they have the power. But they all, we also have the power to make symbols, to use language in our own context, and to exist in that third space by not just mimicking, not just copying, but also being productive about our own protests. So maybe that's, that's one uh, meaning that... Um, is also very important in in this discourse. And so I also remember in Mom Chat um, discussing Japanese occupation, wherein the Japanese occupation of the Philippines, wherein uh, the some high officials of the Japanese colonial powers came to the Philippines and were Filipinos were supposed to ano uh, to 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 welcome them. To welcome them and then they're they're saying uh it should be banzai banzai right so like, mabuhay parang ganon but the filipinos not understanding or just plain being humorous is saying bangkai bangkai ganyan. so and of course the japanese did not understand that no so that's one way of mimicry that is uh yun nga, going into that humorous uh appropriation of something that isn't theirs because it's a it is a different language but something you more that is making fun of the situation but at the same time understanding the situation and doing something about it yes it's something also that we do right now in protest in our uh in our social media perhaps that is a part of that. So again, it's not just in the context of uh, history kumbaga or the past but it co could also be with the present. So ambivalence is another term uh, that is discussed by Baba. So ambivalence is a simultaneous attraction toward a repulsion from an object, person, or action. The colonized subject is never simply and completely opposed to the colonizer. And it denotes about the fluctuating relation of the colonizer and the colonized. Again, it's related to mimicry because when you are able to mimic or yun nga, to make fun <laughs> or to appropriate the symbols of power it is it results to an ambivalent position wherein you are not just purely powerless again going back to the idea of that there is no pure culture you are now in a position and you're now in an ambivalent position wherein you can actually fight the system okay because you know for example you know the language you you know the language you you know you're you are aware that you are not just oppressed, then there will be something changing in the relationship. And the colonizer is also aware of this. Okay, itong ambivalence. There is ambivalence in terms of uh, the difference. Yes, you are different, but you are not exactly different. And so, nakalagay dyan, the colonized subject is never simply and completely opposed to the colonizer. Again, this is a response and a continuation, a nuance to the previous discussions that we had about the subaltern, about the uh, or Orient and Occident. Okay, It's not just a simple binary. You are now in a space where it's ambivalent. And ambivalence is simultaneously good and bad. It's good because it could be productive, you could... You could be, it could be a site for resistance. It could be bad when you are, for example, ambivalence, for example, in, of people in a, in a quarter life crisis. It's a very ambivalent position wherein you are an adult and you can do whatever you want. It's, for example, if you have work, okay, there are more, there are many opportunities, but at the same time, you cannot do anything you want because of the, the fact that you are still young. 
you're not quite young, you're not quite old. So this idea of not quite is in is applied to the context of the colonized. That you are not quite there yet, that you're not quite white, for example, in the case of colonized peoples in um in Africa, you're not quite white and you're not quite black. So going back to the discussion of Fanon in our lecture notes, you're not quite. But what are you doing? What will you do about this position of being not quite? And so ambivalence, this position or this character of your being or your identity, this your ambivalent identity, is actually a result of actually the colonizer. Okay, the colonizer being the colonizer's policies, right? Because the colonizer wants you to be the same to the point that you can understand them, okay? But you will be the same, but not quite. Because you cannot be the same as the colonizer because you may think of overthrowing them. Okay, again, Rizal's work is very much important important uh, with regards to this idea because in his work he notes how we were not educated and um, we were not educated and we were not um, given the same laws the same humanity that is in the laws of the europeans just because we are the colonized because there's 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 a thing in the in spanish history wherein they made a more democratic constitution but they did not apply that to that to their colonies and uh, the propagandistas like uh, Rizal argued about that that why didn't didn't you give this freedom this idea of equality in the Philippines because they went when they went abroad they saw that people are freer there they they, they saw that they are more progressive and why is it that we are not why we are not uh, given the same treatment so in that point of ambivalence the colonizer is ambivalent. I want you, the colonized, to be like us, but not exactly like us because there is still a difference. We still see you as different from us. Okay, and for the on the part of the colon of the colonized, it will be something offensive, right? It will be something offensive. So another point there is a view of the colonizer, the colonizer becomes ambivalent in the third space. Colonial colonialism become becomes normalized and colonized produce their own hybrid identity. Yon. When you're aware that you are treated differently, you are now asking yourself, why are why am I treated differently? And uh, of course you will see that it's because of your colonialism of the colonialism and the process of colonialism. And now the co the colonized will now produce or create its own hybrid identity which will be um, very important in the idea of hybridity later. Hybrid, in simple terms, is of course a mix of two cultures. But Baba is not just describing a mixing of two cultures. So again, the example of colonial education is important in the ambivalence. Okay, That we were educated, but we are educated to the point that we understand them and we follow them. Right? So, ambivalence is also a combination of mimicry and mockery. So, it complicates as opposed to simplifying, as simplifies the colonized colonizer relation. Okay? When something is ambivalent, you're trying to, even in research, right? When something is ambivalent, something is not clear, you are more forced to, to look for evidence, you are more forced to, uh, to study it, to actually clarify both sides, yung nung ambivalence. Okay, so it actually complicates the relationship. Again, it destroys the binary. Yun yung idea ng ambivalence mimicry. It destroys the binary. It destroys the fact that you are just inferior and the, the, the colonizer is just superior. And it's very detrimental to the position of the power of the colonizer. And this relates to the idea of decentering that will we will relate to Chakrabarti later on. No, if the colonizer is the center, they have the power. The idea of mimicry and ambivalence actually destroys or yun nga, it's that detrimental to this position. Because when you see, 
For example, when you see that the colonizer has flaws and the colonizer has many flaws. When I say colonizer, that this could be, you know, uh, a general term for colonizer in terms of the historical colonizers or the West or even our oppressors in the present. They have the monopoly of power. They have the monopoly of knowledge, for example. But when you see that they are wrong, okay, and you are now in that ambivalent position, then you kind of question their power. Why are they there? Why are we here in this position? Okay, so, yeah, decentering also is very detrimental for colonizers because when the colonized is now aware of their position, they cannot claim that they are superior anymore. Lalo na ngayon. Like, for example, uh, we cannot say that there is a superior culture even though, for example, their technology is better, their democracies are better, we cannot say that they are superior and they cannot say that they are superior to the rest of the world because we have values that are the same and we have values that are not comparable. Okay, so yun daw yung nangyayari kapag nagkakaroon ng decentering. Yeah. And also, when you open up yourself, to other people. Like, for example, when the colonizers open up their culture, their knowledge to the people, they're also opening up to criticism. Okay? And even though they have mechanisms to, ano, to, they have mechanisms to quell such, uh, uh, such, parang, criticisms from, and the, oppositions from 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 the people yun nga again there will come a time that the colonizer will be the ones uh setting the conversation that um this is not right yun. and you know even though this is very very general again you can you can apply it to the present situation okay now that there is there is no binary there is no categories. There is just the third space, a fourth space, if you may, wherein you could be in a position where you are, hindi siya neutrality, eh, hindi siya neutrality, but it's a position wherein you can weigh the options that you have. You can, it's a position wherein you know the good and bad of each, each, for example, if it's a decision of each decision that you, you will make. Right? So, or a person that you will follow, right? So, it's this idea of mimicry and mockery, lalo na yung mockery, no? Um, for example, the Spaniards, again, in the in the last uh, century of their rule in the Philippines, increasingly, there have been more uh, criticisms against them that are published, for example, in Europe. And they're annoyed by it. No, they are annoyed by it. They are offended by it because their position as the powerful colonizer is being threatened. Okay. So yeah, it this position of ambivalence destroys the binaries, and that's what's important because when the binary is destroyed, uh, and the colonize colonize colonizer relation is not just of domination, then there would be avenues of that open up for resistance. So in this process of mimicry and um, ambivalence, there is a process also of displacement, distortion, dislocation, and repetition. So again, uh, we go back to the idea of Said wherein it seems as if the colonizer has the privilege to know the colonizer the colonized. Parang sila lang yung may pwedeng alam or may pwedeng uh, mechanisms para alamin kung ano yung buhay or ano yung future nitong mga, nitong mga colonized. But uh, according to Baba, the colonized repeats the actions of the colonizer and in the process realizes their differences, urging the colonized to rethink these actions and create a hybrid identity of their own. Like even though, uh, for example, Fanon also discusses this, that they wanted to be white, the goal is really not to be white. The goal really is to go back to the roots, right? To national consciousness. So it's the same thing that's happening here. It's repetition of uh, repetition in mimicry. But in the process of being like our colonizers, we 
we are now increasingly being more aware that what we need is not to look back or to to copy whatever the colonizers taught us, but to look back at our own culture and uh, see what works for our culture. So, for example, in the Philippines, we have been taught by Americans supposedly by uh, to to be a to be a democracy. No, so the constitutions were made during that time. But then later on, we re- renegotiated and we talked amongst ourselves and uh, tried to make sense whether that idea or whether that process is still for us. Okay, so we had a new constitution and uh, maybe, of course, there are still remnants of the ideas in in previous constitutions. But what is important is that we rethought the actions and created identities that are our own. And yun nga, this could be hybrid identities because it's a mix of an identity of a colonized person and a post-colonial person wherein you are now aware of the legacies of colonialism and um, and now making or constructing a future of your own. So I like this uh, idea that mimicry, ambivalence, in terms of uh, colonialism and the decades, centuries after, is repetition with a difference. We cannot escape the idea that, of course, we're colonized. We resemble our colonial masters because they left us with this culture, with this with this religion, with this political system. But it's repetition with a difference. We are not exactly like them. And the fact that we continuously and consciously change ourselves so that we could have a more Filipino culture, a more Filipino government, for example, is the productive part or is the good side of uh, or a kind of resistance to our colonial past. So now we go to hybridity. So hybridity as a term, um in the beginning it's a very it's a, it has a negative con- connotation why because it is used by colonizers to to refer to colonized peoples like hybrid populations wherein they are neither white nor black so it's very derogatory but hybridity in terms of uh, baba is uh, according to him is a is can can be located in the third space so it's a compromise between the always seemingly conflicting or contradictory worlds of colonialism and post-colonialism and colonizer and the colonized. And again, it dismantles the hierarchy of cultures. When you have a hybrid or the hybridization of cultures, you recognize the effects of both uh, of colonialism and your resistance to colonialism and how it affects the construction of uh, an identity of a future that is your own okay so because this is a problem of post-colonial uh, cultures because they struggle they struggle to be part of uh, they struggle after colonialism because there will always be a crisis of identity. Na yun nga, dinidiscuss din to ni Fanon. But in terms of a, of a society, there will be a crisis. So, hybridity will be the compromise. Okay, yun yung sinasabi ko kanina na um, uh, identities that are formed that are beneficial for a future. Like, for example, the Constitution it could be very American, very uh, Western, no? but there are parts of it that uh, could also attain uh, uh, pertain to to Filipino values and Filipino ideals and aspirations. Hybridity is also a counter narrative to the identity imposed by colonizers. Again, eting ibig sabihin natin by negotiation. We are branded by colonizers as idio, uh, ano indios. Okay, we are branded by colonizers, for example, by the Americans as also very backward until the present. That's that's how they see developing countries. But in a hybrid space, in this space where we can resist, we can use the language of our of our own colonizers to to know and to to create our own identities. It becomes a counter narrative. Okay, but again, there's a bad part of it because 
it endangers the identity of the colonized. It results to anxiety, a realization of their frustrations and their fluid personality. So this is where the psychoanalytic part of uh, Baba's work is uh, coming in. Because he says that there will be anxiety on the part of the colonized. Because when you're in hybrid position, again, uh, I as an example, yung quarter life crisis nga, that you're not, you're neither an adult nor a child, so uh, there are things that you can do and that there are things that you cannot do. It's the same with uh, co colonized peoples that until the present, for example, the Philippines, is we are still negotiating our identity. So if you remember our discussions before, uh, we are negotiating our identities, whether we are Asian, we are Western because of our uh, religion and our proficiency in English. Our identity is very fluid. So, until the present, kasi nga naman isang, wala pang isang daang taon bago, bago tayo lumaya sa ating, ano, sa ating mga colonizers. Hindi ba? Like, for example, 1945. Meron pa bang, ah, may 100 years na ba nun? So, ilang generations din yun. So, we are still in this process of finding what works for us. And um, this is why uh, Baba's work is also important because he drives home the point that colonialism is not yet done. Okay, so it also leads to a situation wherein um, we are forever or we are for a long time being in a, in a position that are not quite or not white. Okay, it's a it's a process. So he also discusses uh he also discusses what he calls the hybrid moment. What the native rewrites is not a copy of the colonialist original, but a qualitatively different thing in itself, where misreadings and incongruity incongruities congruities expose the uncertainties and ambivalences of the colonialist text and deny it an authorizing presence. So, um, again, the key is, you know, in the third space, in the ambivalent space, in the hybrid moment, we are thinking of how to construct ourselves without or with the recognition of our colonial past. Okay. And when we try to understand ourselves, when we try to re renegotiate our identities, we are not letting other people speak for us. Okay, we describe and we we know this new culture that is born, and we deny the idea that the only the colonizer can speak about us, unlike what Said says, and we also deny that it is only the colonizer that knows about about us, because uh, eventually it's because it's it's for our own identity. So we deny it that an authorizing presence, and also we do not follow or we do not copy the same thing that they did like for example for feminism for feminism we want equality for both men and women so if we are for example women women will be in an ambivalent position wherein we know we are oppressed but we also know that men are oppressed so in that ambivalent or in that third space wherein we re renegotiate our identities it does not mean that when you're a feminist you will also harass and oppress men because that's, for example, that's the way of the colonizer. That's the way of the oppressor, right? But the constructive, productive thing to do is to change the system so that it will change for both uh, sexes and all genders, okay? So this hybrid moment, okay, this being hybrid, this mimicking, this joking, this being humorous about situations, this ambivalence, okay, are, they are tackled in such a very individual or psychological, meaning it's, it's kind of a personal process, but this personal process, according to Baba, is really seen in, um, in cultures that are very, are post-colonial, okay, like, for example, the divisions that we have right now over values, over, um, for example, our ideas, I, ideas of uh, beauty, of justice, of intelligence, these are very much Western, Western in orientation. Like, sino bang maganda sa Pilipinas mga, uh, for example, 
may basta may ano pa rin, may mold pa rin of beauty of intelligence you know like when you're good in english you're automatically intelligent mga ganyan na mayabang ka na agad right uh these ideas are still with us even with us and we are constantly negotiating it now where did it where did this come from is this really filipino and this anxiety of who we are as filipinos what is actually filipino nationalism is what is discussed by baba in the ideas of hybridity mimicry and ambivalence so uh some exam some examples in post-colonial literature and popular media baba discusses uh english literature wherein it's fiction it's fiction but um it talks about that idea of ambivalence, ambivalence hybridity okay um we're in and daming books na ganyan diba na uh, ang bida ay from a new generation and is now uh renegotiating his identity na kung katulad ba siya nung mga nakaraang generation or he or she will make his own path in the world ganon so that's kind of the dilemma that post-colonial cultures have according to baba and other popular media is a for example um this uh this work by flores 2019 comics as third space an analysis of continuous negotiation of identities in post-colonial philippines you can read it it's short but it talks about hybrid worlds reimagined communities and intertextual signifiers in comics such as trese so in trese as you know it's uh it's uh it's now a, a series right but it comes from this uh comics okay um that uh discusses or that tackles the the life of uh, trese who is uh at the present generation and her relationship with the modern world and they also discuss about mythologies you know? so you can see you can say that it is an attempt to kind of uh, make something that is not western using philippine mythologies now of course hindi lang trese ang gumawa nito pero meron ding iba others to make it relevant or to make it very relatable to Filipinos, what uh, the author did is to to use symbols that Filipinos understand. Again, that is a form of hybridity. That when you look at your own culture and see what you understand. So he has characters here that uh, resemble uh, celebrities like Manny Pacquiao. And then, so according to him, um, the these worlds, which are uh, fantasy worlds, discuss uh, a metaphor of hybrid worlds a metaphor also of the worlds the world that we inhabit today that we are in the modern or the contemporary world but we are still haunted by our past for example the past during the martial law or past as a colo- as a colonized peoples and how do we negotiate that identity what do we do right do we do we uh, dismantle that past okay do we get fooled by that past or do we move on from that past through studying it through recognizing its errors and creating a future that is filipino kasi yun naman like for example the elections that are coming up is uh, an exercise of filipinos looking at the future and looking at themselves ano ba talaga yung gusto ko ano ba yung gusto ko na makita sa pilipinas and in asking yourself that it's actually an a, a practice it's a, an exercise of looking into yourself and asking what you want to create as a future what is your identity diba? so that's why when we we see people uh, supporting certain candidates you can see them ano you can see them invoking ideas such as uh, this person represents me this person represents the philippines this person represents the future of the philippines and even though there are no colonial contexts there we can still apply this idea of i'm um, ambivalence uh hybridity mimicry these are very big words but um it just talks about the space wherein people can think about themselves and can think about or on creating a future that is um that is the future that is for themselves the future that defines them 
that is consistent with their identities. Kasi nga, identity is a very, a very, very uh, difficult topic. Not just in Soxai, right? But, uh, but even in our own personal lives. And that is what Baba is applying in his, in his work. Connecting and nuancing also other post-colonial worlds. So, ganun din. In, for example, in, in comics such as Trese, ganun din yung mga anxieties. The anxieties of, um, for example, continuing your family's legacies. Diba? Um, the mingling of the past and the present, the modern and the traditional. Yan. And the finding of something that is not that is not, for example, the context of the film, uh, the context of the uh, series is that it is the first animated uh, series, Filipino animated series in Netflix. So, yung pag-market nila doon ay, yun nga, it's the first. So, what does that tell us? Right? What, what, what does that mean? Okay, should we be proud? So, this causes essentially, yun nga, the the continuing process of the renegotiation of um, of identity and uh, our rethinking of our own values that we still have to renegotiate values, political system, our uh, views about our world views. Okay, so we will continue this discussion in Chakra Party. So the next few slides will be about uh, Chakrabarti. So if you if you uh, reach this point, you can take a break. So the best Chakrabarti is one of the founding members of the Subaltern Studies Group. Uh, we have discussed this in the Spivak lecture notes. He is also a historian. Um, his key works uh, include uh, Provincializing Europe in 2000, which will be we will be discussing in a bit, and Habitations of Modernity Essays in the Wake of uh, Subaltern Studies, published in 2002. He is still currently publishing on, uh, on certain topics such as uh, uh, planetary history, so you can check out his uh, publications. So according to him, Europe, one could say, has already been provincialized by history itself. So the main po point of this book, of his book, is to, again, nuance uh, something with regards to post-colonialism, which is European intellectual thought. Okay, so this is the task that we have for this course, especially uh, for you, for your own disciplines, to think about our own disciplines and how it has been very complicit with the ideas of Orientalism, for example, or um, other post-colonial post-colonial or other colonial intellectual traditions. Okay, so that is uh, one of the major things that Chakrabarti is um, discussing here. So according to him, Europe has already been provincialized, but of course, there still needs to be uh, tackled about this. So, there are certain problems in social scientific scholarship. So, according to him, concepts such as citizenship, the state, civil society, public sphere, human rights, equality before the law, the individual, distinctions between public and private, the idea of the subject, democracy, popular sovereignty, social justice, scientific rationality, and so on, all bear the burden of European thought and history. So, for him, and uh, we also saw in this uh, part of the course, which is the thinkers, we saw that they are still looking at the colonial past. And uh, when we fast forward to the present, we see the legacies of this colonial past that, um, were, that were handed down to us, which are concepts such as this. Like, for example, our very idea of citizenship and the state and the society and all of these that are familiar to you its definitions may differ maybe um, depending on the discipline you were coming from but as a social science uh, endeavor these these concepts have very western origins so kung i-review -re ninyo yung ano yung uh, 100 nyo siguro so in short actually these are very modern concepts 
in the beginning of the course, we have discussed modernity as something that is very much related to post-colonialism because post-colonialism became the avenue of uh, modern ideas. And these modern ideas are very destructive for post-colonial peoples. Hindi ba? Na because this set the history of other of post-colonial societies. It set their history. Pag hindi ka modern, kapag hindi ka uh, hindi mo finalo itong enlightenment ideas that you're you cannot say that you are developed. If you cannot follow uh, ideas of development from the West, then you are not developed. So it's very destructive for post-colonial um, societies. But we still use this uh, up to this day, right? So um, yeah, according to Shakarbarti, the European colonizer of the 19th century both preached this enlightenment humanism. Yeah, all of these, most of these are enlightenment enlightenment concepts. They preach this humanism at the colonized and at the same time denied it in practice. Okay, so so therefore, even though, for example, in the Philippines we're democratic, it is not the same democracy that was born in Europe, for example. It's a kind of hybrid democracy, going back to the idea of hybridity. It's a kind of hybrid democracy that who, uh, which problems, the problems of which we still need to fix until the present. Other problems in social scientific scholarship are the following. Number one is that it critiques to such concepts are also Western. So when we say that ah, those concepts are very neoliberal, liberal, the, the critiques to them are still Western, such as Marxism. So Marxism is also very Western. So um, also in the present, these ideas, these concepts, and the disciplines that are attached to them are the most alive in universities, yun nga, yung intellectual, inte uh, European intellectual tradition. So um, the mainstream thinkers in the disciplines that we have, like economics, uh, uh, political science, um, history, now, they're the most alive in universities, uh, juxtaposed maybe to, to non- in the social sciences. Huh? No, so they're the most alive in the universities. So European intellectuals also are discussed as if they are contemporaries. Maybe we can relate to this. No, but non-European thinkers need to be always contextualized. And the traditional or old intellectual traditions are considered dead. Like for example, uh, to quote uh, Chakrabarty, European thinkers in their categories are never quite dead for us in the same way. South Asianist social scientists would argue passionately with a Marx or a Weber without feeling any need to historicize them or to place them in their European intellectual context. In the present, we are still using Marx, Weber. So, of course, in the Soxai, in our college right now, we are very much... Uh, guilty of this. No, kasi nga yan eh, the, the beginnings of our discipline are very Western. And uh, you see this difference in treatment when we are discussing, for example, Asian philosophies, Asian mathematicians, historians, for example, or African, which is also not discussed much in in our in our college. We we always say that uh, we, this is contextualized in this period, this is born from this period, this is very specific to this period. Like, for example, Confucianism is very specific to um, the, the period in China where, in, where, where it was, uh, no, where, where it, was uh, where, where it first uh, came out. Unlike, for example, the, the ideas of Marx, the ideas of Wittgenstein and uh, Heidegger or... Um, uh, Kant, that are considered timeless, all right? So, for example, when we also say about, uh, when we also discuss indigenous math, we always contextualize it in a group. This is, this is, this is a good, again, it's, I'm not saying that it's not a good practice. It's a good practice. But we see how we treat Western European, Western or European intellectual traditions vis-a-vis -vis our own traditions, Okay. We will also be talking about this in when we when I discuss indigenous knowledge and scientific knowledge as a, as a case. No, because there, scientific knowledge does not need justification. 
Okay? It's scientific. It's accepted. But when we talk about indigenous knowledge, suddenly we need to discuss it. Like, is it is it the same knowledge as as scientific knowledge? So maybe you go back to your Soxai 180. Ano ba yung mga ano? Ano ba yung mga parameters kung bakit kung paano magiging knowledge ang isang knowledge? Ma authentic ba ito? Yung mga ganang tanong. Ay tinatanong din si indigenous knowledge. Pero syempre, ano, repli- may, may replicability ba tong knowledge na to? Ganyan. So, some 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 uh, indigenous knowledge, syempre hindi niya mamimit lahat ng requirements na yun. So, do we consider it not knowledge? So, may mga ganun na diskusyon kapag Asian indigenous knowledge, but if it's scientific knowledge, uh, it's very much uh, established already. So, why do we do this? Why do we have uh, different categories and very different um, notions about uh, non-European knowledges? So, that's one. These are the problems that are being raised by Chakrabarty in provincializing Europe. According to him, these ideas or concepts can be plotted or can be contextualized through the concept of historicism. So, I did not define historicism here here because he did not define it too and there are many definitions of this. But historicism is very much related to what we were talking about since the beginning of this class, which is the linear history or progress. That in how we in the world today are still are still beholden or are still affected by this idea that whatever Europe achieved, we could achieve. Okay? That history is linear or that we are progressing, that we need to arrive at a certain point so that we could be called developed. Okay? So that's historicism that you consider that you consider that a society is defined by its history, will be defined by its history. Its history meaning the progress of the things that are happening in that in that country and that it will end in the same way as history, which is yun nga, progress and development. So an idea that could uh, explain that would be first in Europe then elsewhere. If it happens in Europe, then other people, other countries could do it as well. But when you say first in Europe, then the rest of the world does not have this. Like for example, there is no Asian Enlightenment. There is no Asian Industrial Revolution. When you when you look at these concepts, these are very Western. Okay, and when you apply it elsewhere, of course, it will essentially refer or privilege the idea of the enlightenment in Europe. So, for, for, for example, when you say Asian enlightenment, kung meron man. Yan. And now we are in the fourth industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution is considered to be the industrial revolution that happened in Europe. Okay, so, yeah, so historicism also alludes to the idea of development as the future of all nations. So, if you want to review on this, you could read the part on development theory in the lecture notes on dependency. So, this historicism is the um, is the idea that is inherent in the social sciences and in the concepts that I have discussed, like human rights. Uh, Democracy, like for example, democracy. Democracy is considered to be an endpoint. Like everyone should be, every country should be democratic. So there are points in history wherein they fought for this, but the Cold War, for example. Now that my, ano, my negative image, yung communism. No, there are the worlding of the world, like third world, first world, and second world, because of democracy. Kasi ang point dapat ay maging first world. Okay, the, the end point or the goal is to be the first world. So again, this is another category that is being imposed upon post-colonial countries. Okay, so that's one example. And uh, to show you how it is inherent in our in our being in our in the social sciences. Uh, it's not just in history. We will see that it's not just in history. Even in the works that we are reading, like for example, John Stuart Mill uh, on liberty and on representative movements and the social contract theories, maybe we are all familiar uh, on this, notes how people go from a state of nature to 
uh, a state of war and then to a state to to a state wherein for example you have the leviathan that will impose contracts covenants okay it's a theory in the social sciences and political science that uh, shows this linear history na dapat state of na nasa state of nature daw tayo and then at the end we will we will have these ideas of liberty of democracy of uh, being a citizen okay na it implies a process okay again this is very western this is very european and john stuart mill's idea of um uh on liberty and on, and on on representative movements, he discusses here how countries uh, can self-govern, can be civilized, but only, only if they wait. Okay, only if they have the permission of the West. In short, so his work had specific sections on the Indian and African case, saying that them and other quote-unquote, rude nations should wait for a specified historical time that needs to elapse before they could even progress, relegating them to an imaginary waiting room of history. Meaning, he says that the Europeans have progressed at this point in time. For example, 100 years. Kailangan 100 years bago ka maging democratic. Kasi sabi nila, itong, dem itong 100 years na to is enough time for you to progress like us in, in the West. And the ideas of liberty, of representation, of state, of equality are based on that idea of historicism. Na kailangan mo muna may requirement ng ano, ilang daang taon. Okay. Kasi nga, ano, for example, democracy daw is homegrown. Okay, is something that they have developed. Totoo nga naman that it's something that developed from their, uh, you know, from from their political, economic, and social systems. And it's also a fact that they have just imposed this on other countries. And other countries, when they wanted to be more democratic, now is ano, now is being now is being uh, criticized by the West where democracy came from. Na no, your democracy is not democracy. Parang ganun. So, um, he says here that there should be a waiting room of history. That, uh, maghintay muna kayo that this is, until this time, you cannot self-govern. We need, you need to be under our, our tutelage pa rin. So, this imaginary waiting room of history is, uh, is still seen in our, in our present day. So, anong example yung makikita natin dito? So the example would be struggles or the resistance. Okay. So um yung kanina, the discourse that you need to wait is considered, you know, the not yet discourse, meaning you are not yet allowed or you, you're not yet fit to be civilized. You're not yet fit to be democ democracies. Okay? So this not yet discourse is uh, has triggered many movements, especially in the 50s until the present, um, to consciously and continuously decolonize. Okay? Because yun nga eh, parang ano, may views pa rin ng, ano, ng historicism, na may views pa rin na ito, yung muning, ito muna yung gagawin mo bago ka maging civilized. Okay? You cannot, the, like what they did with the Philippines, na ilang taon muna ng, ano, may guided uh, my guided, uh, the guided uh, government. So before we can self-govern, yeah. So, kailangan mo dadaw natin mag-aral bago maging posible yung self-government because the self-government that they give us is essentially civilization. So decolonization movements, anti-colonial nationalisms, and subaltern movements in the 50s to the 60s and up to the present is now invoking the now discourse. Meaning, we are not beholden on the. We are not. We you should not apply to to us this idea of a linear history. You cannot say that you are developed and we cannot develop because we have not had the same amount of time. Because of course there was colonialism. There was there were other things. Okay, that now the countries, for example, in his in his example, the in, in India is now fighting for independence because independence should be now and not later. 
Okay. Kasi di ba yun yung justification ng mga colonizer no, nitong 1900s na yes, we will we will make you free or make you independent later when you have learned self-government. And uh, you know how offending that is for a country that has a culture of its own, that has uh, a history of its own even before colonialism. It is a direct hit or it's a direct uh, assault kumbaga, on our own capabilities, okay? On our own capabilities to self-govern, okay? Which is what is fought then nung, ano, nung 1900s sa Philippines that kailangan mapabilis itong self-government na ito. So, underlying, an underlying discourse in that is yung idea nga na hindi tayo marunong mag-self-govern, which is again, offensive, but it, it was the experience of post-colonial countries from from uh, the 1950s until the present. Actually, the post-war. Hindi lang siya sa gobyerno, actually, sa ano rin siya, sa development. When uh, international financial institutions uh, lent money to develop, developing countries like the Philippines, may kasama yung, ano, may kasama yung mga, um, may kasama siyang mga conditions na ito yung dapat gawin mo sa ekonomiya mo kasi ito yung tama ito yung nagawa na namin ito yung ito yung fit para sa ekonomiya that led to many countries being uh, in debt like the Philippines okay because we appropriated something that is not nearly or not really appropriate just because kailangan nating ano sundin yung mga sundin yung mga structural conditions nung, it, nung mga utang na ito. So, this led, this triggered movements. Like, for example, yung yung kay Fano, na um, even though the, colon, the colonizers are saying that we are still inferior, it, the time is now. The time to fight for independence is now. So, Mula noong 1950s to the 1960s hanggang ngayon, we are we have nationalist struggles. Okay? So according to Baba, what is important in the nationalist struggles will be of course the people who are part of it, right? So important element, an important element of the nationalist struggle is number 1, if the national elites reject the waiting room version of history. Meaning if they reject that um we are not subject we are subject to the linear uh, linear idea of history na if they stop uh, stop believing in that idea na superior ang ano superior ang west superior ang mga colonizers then they will lead a revolution so this actually happened again in the philippines when um it's the same rhetoric kasi with the spaniards and the americans na they believe that we are we cannot rule ourselves right even though we put up a government of our own at the end of uh the end of the spanish uh spanish colonial period okay another is that the peasant could be a full participant in the political life of the nation even before citizenship. Anong ibig sabihin ng before citizenship dyan? Because my idea, remember, citizenship is one social scientific idea that is very Western. Pag sinabi mong citizen ka in the Greek context, you are actually holding an office. Hindi ba? You're holding an office. You are active in, in making decisions. Okay, so now if we want to have a country of our own, post-colonialism, after colonialism, we need the rejection of that idea na hindi pa, hindi pa tayo handa. Yun yung, yun yung sinasabi. We should reject that idea that hindi pa tayo handa. Ano ba kasi yung motivation or sinasabi nila bakit hindi pa tayo handa? Hindi pa tayo handa dahil hindi tayo edukado. Hindi pa tayo handa dahil hindi pa natin kaya. At hindi pa edukado nga yung ating mga, lalo na yung mga, pang, yung mga karaniwang tao. Ang sinasabi naman ni Chakra Barty dito is that hindi natin kailangan na handa yung mga tao in terms of citizenship. Okay, like for example, sina, yung revolution nga nung, 19, uh, nung 18, uh, 1890s, hindi ba? Hindi naman nila kailangan ng idea ng citizenship. etong idea ng citizenship ay parang, yun nga, it's a very western idea. Okay? So, 
the peasant that he's talking about here, if we're we're following, for example, a Marxist uh, perspective, the working class, for example, the working class and the peasant, yung mga pinaka pangkaraniwang tao na may na marami sila and in their numbers could be could also be power. Um, sila yung dapat na sinasama o sila yung dapat uh, nagli-lead nitong revolution so that we can properly decolonize and we could properly be uh, could properly have a nationalism. Okay, so um, according to um, Chakrabarty, the key to the nationalist struggle that could be a way wherein we could do away with European European or Western ideas of citizenship, of democracy, is to involve the peasant in, in the struggle. Okay. The problem, however, is that, according to him, there is a strong sense in which a peasant is still being educated and developed into a citizen. There is this idea that protests, for example, are very elitist. Okay. Protests are very elitist in the sense that it is only involving the elites, and also, for example, university students na may ano, privilege para makapag-aral, ganyan. Kaya di ba ngayon may bad name nga yung mga protesta dahil parang nagsasayang lang daw ng oras ang mga nagpaprotesta, nagsasayang ng pera ng bayan, uh, ng gugulo lamang, bakit hindi na lang magtrabaho. Yung mga ganong ideya ay dahil sinasabi, parang hindi pa rin tinitingnan yung pagpaprotesta or pakikibaka bilang isang lehitimong paraan para makipag-usap uh, uh, for example, sa gobyerno o para maging isang mamamayan ng isang ng isang bansa. ba? Ang problema daw sa mga anti-colonial and anti uh, uh, or nationalist struggles is that ma maraming pagkakataon ay hindi na isasama ang mga mahirap, ang mga karaniwang tao dahil ang tingin natin ay sila ay tinuturuan pa ring maging isang mamamayan. Okay? Ito yung discussions din recently, no, that our voters are not our voters, the the common people that are voting are not educated enough. That's why they're voting for this specific candidate. Yung ganitong mga takes ay parang related din dito na nakakapigil siya sa ating pag uh, patuloy na pag pag ano pagiging nationalist okay sa patuloy na pagdidecolonize kasi may mga hindi tayo na isasama kasi uh, we are still subscribing to that historicist idea pag sinasabi daw natin ito na kailangan pa nating uh, turuan ang mga kailangan nating turuan yung mga uh, botante kung ano ba yung demokrasya. Ito kasi yung ano eh, features ng democracy. Yan, ito yung dapat nating ituro sa kanila. Uh, kailangan pa rin natin silang, they need to be educated para hindi sila boboto ng mga magnanakaw, ganyan. That's actually very historicist according to Chakrabarty. It's very historicist in the sense that you are still following yung sinasabi ko kanina, European intellectual tradition. When you think that they need to be educated and developed into a citizen, you are subscribing to a historicist idea of history, historicist or linear idea of history, wherein may requirement ka para maging involved sila sa proseso ng iyong bansa. And why is this important for our post-colonialism course or the RSOCSI 198? Because it hinders, it stops that idea of decolonization or anti-colonial movement or anti uh, or nationalist movement or struggle that or emancipation that is the end point or the goal of post-colonialism. Okay, so the peasant in the peasant in a post-colonial country is educated to be a citizen. Actually, yung peasant in a post-colonial country according to Chakrabarty, is kind of in between. They are or, already a citizen and they perform the duties of such, such as voting, protest, marches, etc. But they are still educated to be a citizen. Siyempre, hindi naman masamang mag-educate. 
Pero kung education na ito ay nanggagaling nga dun sa historicist assumption na kailangan muna nilang maging edukado bago bumoto or bago sumuporta, ay hindi nakakatulong. Hindi nakakatulong doon sa uh, ating purpose of emancipation, ating purpose of nationalism, and ating purpose of decolonization. Okay? Their position is ambivalent. And this also shows us, us shows us the pedagogic and performative aspects of nationalism. These are actually discussed by uh, Baba, but I won't be discussing it in in detail. Pero yun daw, yung um, the case of peasants in post-colonial countries is a case of uh, how the European intellectual tradition is still very prevalent. Especially also when we subscribe to such historicist European intellectual traditions, not just in our works, but also in our relationship with our fellow country, uh, men and women. So what this shows is that we still subscribe to the historicist European intellectual tradition in our works. For Shakar Bharti and the subaltern studies theorists, there is a need to move away from two of the ontological assumptions entailed in secular conceptions of the political and the social. That, number one, we are not stuck in linear time or history. We can actually be, devi we can actually deviate from this linear time. Okay? Kasi hindi naman natin pwedeng sabihin na waiting room yun nga, yung waiting room version of history na should wait a 100 years para maging ano tayo, maging totoong demokrasya tayo. Maghintay tayo ng 100 years para totoong madecolonize tayo. Or maging totoong Filipino yung nationalism or yung ating um, totoong Filipino yung nationalism or totoong Filipino yung ating bansa. We are not stuck and we can actually do something about it now. So, it's not not yet, but it's now. And then, humans are not ontologically singular. So, so ito, uh, this is an aspect that I won't be discussing because Chakrabarti here goes uh, to discuss how uh, movements in India have been very much uh, affected or uh, influenced by very by by the spiritual side of humans meaning ginagamit yung mga uh, simbolo from their religion from their uh, belief systems para maging parte ng isang bansa so syempre may mga ganyan din sa Pilipinas but i won't be discussing that ang gusto ko lang makita natin is ito yung that humans are not stuck in linear time and history so anong kinalaman ng lahat ng to sa pagpo-provincialize ng Europe So, provincializing Europe means, number one, to be cognizant that we are still using these universals that we are trying to uh, critique. These universals, itong mga sinasabi ko, democracy, uh, historicism, we are still using them and we are still engaging them. And it is still very important to engage with them. Okay? Kasi we cannot do away with them. Okay? What we can do is to nuance them. Provincializing Europe, according to it, at the beginning of this presentation or this part of the presentation on Chakrabarty, we said that Europe has already been provincialized by history. Yes, because now there are many movements to study things outside of Europe, such as area studies, like for example, West Asian, East Asian studies, Southeast Asian studies, Pacific studies. These are very important um, achievements. Yung subaltern studies is also one part of it. These are very much important, very important achievements and milestones uh, in, yun nga, provincializing Europe. It, it also does not mean that we are responding directly to European intellectual traditions. It also means that we care now more, we, mo, we care more about uh, finding about more about ourselves rather than defending ourselves against our previous colonizers. Okay? So, it does not necessarily mean rejecting or discarding European thought. So, so, sorry, that's thought. But means to explore how this thought, which is now everybody's heritage and which affects us all, may be renewed from and for the margins. So, in the case of the peasants, it's like that. You recognize them being agents of their own and you recognize them or us, no, having symbols, having our own ways 
to be a part of the society or a part of a political system. Okay? So, provincializing Europe would now start from that. You provincialize it, meaning not really marginalize it, but recognize that now, mas marami na yung, ano, yung interest sa non-European uh, aspects of life, non-European aspects of, uh, of uh, intellect, uh, non-European intellectual traditions because these inevitably uh, affect the lives of people or these inevitably uh, says more or tells us more about ourselves than the European intellectual traditions, which is also a part of what we are doing in this course. So, uh, his book also discusses this. How is European thought applied in non-European life worlds? For example, is Marxism applicable everywhere? Okay. Is there an alternative to neoliberal economic and political systems? Um, how did some countries go about uh, their democracies? Is it the same democracy everywhere? So, yun yung mga questions na meron dito that are not essentially post-colonial. Meaning, you can ask this question, for example, how is uh, democracy in, uh, how democracy is different in Norway than in the United States? Yun yan. So, there is no post-colonial idea there. But, the idea that a European thought, okay, a European intellectual tradition, which is again, uh, which facilitated colonialism before, how is it used now? How has it changed now into, for example, a social democratic uh, country wherein you have uh, a better quality of life? How is that, how is this thought, how is this idea applied in non-European uh, life worlds? Okay, so again, hindi lang, hindi lang non-European but also European too. Okay, so the idea here is not to privilege it anymore. Okay. So in questions of uh, in questions of uh, for example, eto ginagawa rin natin to sa mga thesis natin hindi ba? Nag-apply ng mga topics na very western and applying it to the context of the Philippines. Maaring magsimula tayo sa mga naisulat nating mga Pilipino tungkol sa ating mga sarili. Okay? Maaring ding magsimula sa for example dun sa nationalist struggle. Paano ba nati? Paano tayo magkakaroon ng isang nationalist struggle nang hindi pagiging ma, nagiging elitista? So, yung mga ganun ay nakapaloob dito sa idea of provincializing Europe. So, this is an appropriate ending to this part of the theorists because it's kind of more reflexive, kumbaga. It makes us reflect of ano nga ba, ano ba, ano nga ba yung ginagawa natin sa post-colonialism. The end of it, it reminds us that post-colonialism is not just an abstract term. Okay, it's not just something that happened in the past. That it's something that we still struggle to, a struggle from, until this day. Okay, so if you have any questions with regards to Shakrabarti and the, uh, um, and Baba, we can discuss that in our synchronous sessions. Thank you very much.